Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about the agronomic science and the cultural management practices that regenerate plant health, soil health, and public health, and that should also regenerate farm profitability. I'm very happy today to have James Johnson here as a guest. James and I have known each other now for, I think, maybe three or four years, something like that. James is an AEA customer. Just want to put that out there so all of you are aware. He has been very gracious in sharing his story and and some of the work that we're doing at AEA. And he has a really incredible story. So I wanted to have him here to share that with all of you as well. James, thank you very much for being here today. Can you offer a little bit of context for our audience? Tell us a little bit about your personal story and background, the scope of your farming operation and the work that you're doing and the context of what's going on. Well, thanks for inviting me, John. I'm I'm humbled by the fact that you you felt that uh, that my story was worthy of being told on this platform. So I'm a fourth generation farmer here in Southwest New Mexico. Our operation started off as a cattle ranch, and in the 1950s, during the drought, much very similar to what we have today, they started drilling irrigation wells, trying to grow feed for the cows. Ultimately, back then, the the farming kept the ranch afloat. They started off producing cattle feed, switched over, started producing, at that point, canning tomatoes, then moved into grain sorghum, cotton, and then we've diversified over the years into onions, chili peppers, pecans, pistachios. And during certain years, we've, we've grown watermelons, pumpkins, spinach, lettuce. There's, uh, we have a very uh, different microclimate here. Our elevation is 4,300 feet. So even though that we're at a real south latitude, we still tend to get cold in the wintertime. We have about 222 degree um, frost free days that allow us to have a pretty diverse crop. Really what hinders us most is probably the extreme heat that we have. I mean, today it's supposed to be 105 degrees. That's probably combined with low humidity given the southern location where you are. Yeah, it's probably going to be about 8% humidity today. I think our average annual rainfall here is about 10 to 10.5 inches. And I think in the last year, we've had just right around 1.5 inches. So we're, it's extremely dry and extremely challenging. How has your agronomy management and the soil and plant and crop management shifted over the last 20 or 30 years over the time that you've personally been involved on the farm? So 30 years ago, we were all flood irrigated or furrow irrigated. Uh, We did everything out of cement ditches with siphon tubes. About 22 years ago, we started uh, installing subsurface drip irrigation. The only constraint to that was the cost. So it took us about 10 to 15 years to get the entire farm. And we're still not completely into drip irrigation yet. We're still slowly installing some on the last 600 acre block that we've got. We've been high intensity chemical fertilizer applications as well as pesticide applications for the last 45, 50 years. We were highly successful with that, I would say right up until about 2005. That was six years into our installation of the subsurface drip irrigation. And it's kind of interesting because things didn't really hit me as to what was happening and how we were starting to degrade. I knew that we weren't in a place that we wanted to be. I knew we weren't yielding what we had when we first applied subsurface drip. We doubled our yields and then we plateaued at that double yield for a couple of years. And then we quickly went off of a cliff. Um, At the time, we had a crop consultant that had worked for us for several years. He had several other customers that used drip irrigation as well. But ours was a little more of a challenging area because we had higher sodium water. So a lot of the things that we did here were trying to mitigate sodium. We used heavy amounts of gypsum trying to get sodiums to move. We've tried a little bit of it all, trying to get that sodium level to go down and only to find out 10 to 15 years later that we were probably working exactly contrary to what we actually needed to be doing. 
What were some of the things that you were doing that were contrary to what you now think is effective? Well, when we pulled soil samples back then and they saw the sodium levels, I mean, at one point we were talking about or laughing that we were going to have to build a railroad to get as much gypsum in as the uh, soil scientists were claiming that we needed to apply. There were some of the recommendations that were for 10 to 15 tons per acre of gypsum. Wow. Wow. Um, so we knew that that wasn't possible, that we, you know, we just absolutely couldn't afford that. We were having to haul gypsum about 100 miles. So the freight was, you know, the gypsum wasn't the cost. It was the freight and the application. But we went on a pretty intense uh, application rate. We were using three to five tons before all of our vegetable crops. And the vegetable crops at that time were chili peppers and onions. And so we were about every other year applying three to five tons. And when we first started applying the gypsum, we saw a yield bump again. And then a couple of years afterwards, it was very similar to when we, when we started installing the subsurface drip irrigation, we saw a plateau and then a, a, a just a cliff again where we started tumbling. I actually at the time had a organic consultant that stopped by and he was selling a few different products to us. He took some samples, some soil samples and water samples and came back and basically informed me and that was the first time that I'd ever heard anybody talk about nutrient balancing and the first time I'd ever heard about that we might be causing our own ultimate demise. Um, when he looked at the sulfur levels after that much application of gypsum, we had some of that stuff that he actually talked about potential sulfur toxicity. And it was interesting because when I talked to the soil scientists, everybody said there's no such thing as sulfur toxicity. And yet we were seeing that we weren't in the place and we weren't going in the direction that we wanted to go. So, he asked one, you know, one of the reasons that we were using it was we were looking for a good source of calcium. So he asked that we find a different source of calcium. He wasn't a constant part of my operation at that point. He was, you know, he was trying to sell a few different products. So he was in and out. And so we looked around and talked to the reps here as, as well as our, our consultant that was working for us at the time. And he convinced us, well, if, if all we're going for is calcium, why don't we use this great liquid fertilizer that can be in, injected into the drip irrigation? It's called CAN-17. Well, we had used CAN-17 for several years, especially in our lettuce crops and spinach crops. And so we integrated that in. I, you know, I remember the day that I ordered several large fertilizer tanks and had them set up on my drip irrigation systems. And, you know, one of the inputs that was put in, you know, these are highly technology advanced irrigation systems. And so I can, I can apply these fertilizers basically at the, at the stroke of a, a mouse off of my computer. So I plumbed that input in and we started railing this, you know, railing this can 17 into a, a siding that was close by and delivering it by the truckload onto the farm. We thought that that was going to be our fix. And over several years and finally coming to some conclusion, we found that wasn't the case. I think you need to elaborate on that story a little bit, James. What happened that you concluded it wasn't the solution for a calcium delivery mechanism? Well, you know, I guess I got to kind of digress. And so I got to talk about your first encounter or my first encounter with you. And so you put on a cotton grower school in Lubbock, Texas, and you stood up and you told your story that you tell on almost every podcast that you're a guest on. And you've told it a couple of times on yours of where you oriented the rows differently when you took on some neighboring ground and all of a sudden you didn't have powdery mildew. I don't think you could have gotten my attention better if you had walked across the room and smacked me in the back of the head with a baseball bat. I was absolutely blown away because I had never heard anybody else have that problem. In the early 2000s, after we put in drip irrigation, we started growing a lot of cucurbits. We, we were growing multiple, I mean, 250 acres of watermelons, a couple hundred acres of pumpkins every year. And I actually had to give up the cucurbit business because I couldn't control the powdery mildew. 
the last season that I had watermelons, I had applied over $1,500 per acre in fungicide applications. We were on four to seven day rotations with fungicide and we weren't able to control it. We lost our vines. It sounds like a very familiar story. And, and it's kind of interesting because take me back to probably 2018, I'm standing in a field. I had an organic consultant that was visiting. He was actually on his way to Phoenix, Arizona to go to a, uh, to a meeting that he had there and he stopped by and we were actually at the time talking about soil moisture meters. I wanted to buy a certain brand of soil moisture meter because I thought it had a good disease model. And he said, uh, well, what disease would you like to model the most? And I said, well, probably powdery mildew because we really struggle with powdery mildew. So he bowed his head a little bit. Then he looks, looks me straight in the eye and says, but who tells the soil moisture meter in the model that you just applied CAN-17? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he's, so he starts explaining to me what nitrate fertilizers do in the plant and how, you know, that's probably the biggest reason that I see the powdery mildew whenever I, when I see it. It took me a little while. I had to go home and think about it. But generally, we started having to spray for powdery mildew two weeks after every CAN-17 application. So wow. it, uh, it was a, a little bit frustrating. And then as I've gone along in my journey towards regenerative agriculture, I find that 95 to 99% of my issues that I've been dealing with have been self-inflicted. And that's extremely frustrating, but it's rewarding to see that we can turn this thing around. Wow. That's quite a story. The one thing that I couldn't point to that clearly in our operation historically is that direct of a correlation that we apply X and then we have a disease problem a few weeks later. And maybe that's just the case because we were constantly applying a whole bunch of different things, a whole bunch of different nutrients and creating all types of excesses and imbalances. It wasn't an, an exact aha moment. It, it uh, For the longest time, we were applying, and it was kind of by the calendar. We didn't realize it. So there was a point whenever the plant, especially with chili peppers, so we would go through the first couple of fertility applications with nitrogen with using 32% UN32. And then once we got to the point where we had started setting blooms, then we would convert it over to CAN-17. And it always generally fell about the same point in the calendar. And so therein lied the fungicide application having to start a couple of weeks later. And we didn't realize, we thought it was more of a calendar issue than it was the application issue. And until that consultant stood there and explained to me what how plants stress with nitrate fertilizers, I mean, I was just blown away. I have a similar story about mycorrhiza. Yeah, I know I've told you this story, but the listeners might want to hear it. So I had a another fertility expert that came from Missouri and we went out and we were soil sampling and we were talking about different applications of this and that because we were, I mean, I've, I've been struggling for years, John. I, we were on a collision course with the ground. I mean, there was, there was actually talks about, about selling the farm because we just could not, we could not rescue profitability and we didn't understand why. So we, we started looking at every single possibility. I had a very good friend of mine that farmed in Missouri that brought his fertility guy out here to try and look and see if we were just doing things wrong with fertilizer applications. He basically subscribed to the Kinsey method. We started looking at different things and that was, that was one of the first indicators that most of my weed problems were probably poorly managed fertilizer issues. And to go back to the gypsum, when the gypsum quit working, I went and pretty much everybody here in the county, I bet in our county, there's not a lot of agriculture here because there's not a lot of water, but I would say 80% of the farms in the county bought compost turners all at the same time. Everybody decided that compost was going to be the savior of the industry. And we've got about 75,000 dairy cows within a 70 mile radius of us and everybody's looking to dispose of manure. So we had a very, you know, a free source of, of compost building material. 
All we had to do was pay the freight from the dairy to the farm. So we started making compost. And I think the first year I probably made 4,000 tons of compost. And we started putting out two to three tons of compost on everything. And again, we saw a quite drastic yield increase that didn't sustain. I took this fertility expert to a friend of mine that's actually a commercial compost producer. And we were talking about compost. And this guy also farms. He grows some onions for me that I process here through my packing facility. And he asked this farmer, you know, what's your fertility plan? And this this friend of mine says, well, you know, before these onions that I planted, I put 16 tons of compost out. And so the, the Kenzie guy asked, says, well, can I see it? Do you have an analysis of your compost? And so my friend handed him the analysis. And after looking at it, he says, do you realize that you've applied about 1,600 pounds of equivalent of potash onto your farm? And he says, wow, I, you know, the Kenzie guy says, I, or I'm really glad you don't have a bindweed problem. And <laughs> I think I dropped my fork at dinner. And I think everybody in the restaurant turned and looked at me because I was stunned because he probably had the worst, the absolute worst field bindweed problem that I've ever encountered and ever seen. And that was the first point that we we realized that maybe the compost was starting to change our soils and starting to change the fertility and seeing that. And at the time, he asked this farmer, he says, you know, what are you doing to control that bindweed? And my friend says, you know, we're spot spraying up to a gallon of Roundup per acre. And the Kinsey guy replied back and says, wow, you probably have no mycorrhiza left. And I remember leaving that dinner that night, and I think I stayed up till probably 4 a.m. because that was the first moment that I heard that Roundup might be causing some of our problems. And that's why I now refer to myself as a recovering glyphoholic because... <laughs> that bottle was so easy to go to. It was so easy. But I look around the farm now and I see that I created my own field bindweed problem. I've been spraying this stuff or have been spraying this stuff for probably 10 plus years with glyphosate with zero control. It does nothing to it. It shakes it off like water off of a duck's back. Glyphosate has no bearing on I almost think now that we've created a glyphosate resistant bindweed on our farm because we've sprayed it so often. Probably. Were there any realizations or what happened with your connection with the glyphosate applications affecting mycorrhizal fungal populations? Did you ever pursue that? Did you ever discover how mycorrhizal populations were being impacted? No, not as far as that, because being a recovering glyphoholic, I hate to admit it, and being a recovering glyphoholic, we've had a hard time leaving the bottle alone. It's just so easy to reach back in the back of the pantry and get that thing out again. But last year, I actually planted some cotton trials for one of the major breeding programs that's owned. I'll leave their name out of it, but we actually had, I think going across a 50 acre block, we had about six different seeds. I planted these trials as part of their product evaluator program. And then following that, because I had a lot of cotton last year, I had to plant onions back into that field. Onions are, are very hard to manage the weed population with just because we plant 220,000 seeds per acre on, on a 64 inch bed top. Actually on a 64 inch bed top, we have 10 lines with two drip tapes underneath it. It was strange to me because I was driving around one Sunday morning checking water and I realized that there was a pattern in the field and there was a difference in the weeds. And I went back to some my maps from the previous year that showed these different products that we were evaluating. And I realized that there was a match. So this is purely observational. There was no other testing or anything else involved. But there was a difference where the different seed varieties were. And I suspect that it might be just because of the root exudates that were secreted out of those different varieties versus the field check level. So it was all GMO crop but there was different stacks. You know, when they start talking about these traits, they talk about stacks. And so there was different 
levels of treatment on these seeds, and we feel like we saw the difference in the weed populations based on where those were planted. Was there also a correlation with the different stacks and different product applications? So were you putting different herbicides on on different spots? What did that look like? We didn't. I had never done any uh, dicamba applications on any cotton products. And it's kind of funny because last year, uh, this stuff was the first varieties that I had planted that actually had dicamba genetics in them. Right about that time was when dicamba came out, wasn't it? So I didn't apply anything other than just a shot of glyphosate over the top. First true leaf emergence on that cotton. It was, you know, all the way across the board, same application. So that's why observationally, all I could think about was a difference in exudates. That is really fascinating. So you have the same herbicide application, but different genetics resulting in a difference in weed expression. What were the differences that you observed in weed expression? Were there different levels of vigor, different species? Just an increase in population of the weeds. And then it was kind of interesting because we had applied a really heavy shot of soil primer with some biodigester and other products in there. Your AEA program has me using a lot of OPA, trying to trying to reduce the hydrocarbon carryover that I've had from years of pesticide, insecticide, and chemical fertilizer use. You know, onions is our highest value crop. It's not uncommon for us to have, by the time we get those things into a bag, to have eight to $9,000 an acre into them. So $100 an acre insurance to mitigate it's important and it it doesn't seem all that expensive in the grand scheme of things. So when we went in and we applied that biology, we stripped it in and it was interesting because the farther away from the strip, the worse the weeds got. But there was also that difference between variety to variety of what was planted there the year before. That is really intriguing to, to observe those differences. I don't recall ever having a conversation with someone where they described differences just based on a different variety of the same species. So that's definitely something I will want to look into a bit more and try to understand better. But yeah, we do understand that the exudates can be different. So that's a really interesting observation. You know, just hearing you make the comment that this is just an observation that we made, that we don't have other data for it. I've been thinking about the state of agricultural research and scientific development and so forth. Far too often, in my opinion, I hear people discount something as just to say, oh, that's just anecdotal evidence. All of a sudden, it stood out to me that, you know, when we say something is anecdotal evidence, we're perhaps missing the second word of that phrase. It is evidence. It may not be quantified, but it's still evidence. (laughs) And so. Well, then it's interesting because research used to be about observation and then trying to prove the theory of why the observation happened. And it seems that current research tends to want to create something and to push that square peg through the round hole until they make it work. And so the observationist, it just doesn't occur as much or as often. It doesn't seem, especially in agriculture, as as maybe it did 50, 60 years ago. The other big observation that we had, because we did put this large shot out, so You have to understand, I am still a recovering glyphaholic. I haven't put the bottle completely away. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. What what does your trend look like? How much have you been able to reduce it? Well, we've trended down, you know, on 2,100 acres of row crops a few years ago, I was buying upwards of 1,700 gallons of, of glyphosate a year. So that was probably making three to four or five applications of glyphosate a year. We switched after we kind of figured out that the compost wasn't the way to go. And I've been growing cover crops for probably 10 or 12 years now. Cover crops are easily terminated with glyphosate. You've got a a weed population that's in there. You want to make sure that that stuff's going to die. So it wasn't uncommon for us to go out and apply 40, you know, 40 ounces of glyphosate to terminate the cover crop. Then say we would plant something like cotton into that and we would come back again. And the mantra has been, you know, use the max rate so that you don't create weed escapes. So pretty much every time we went across the field, we were 40 ounces, 40 ounces, 40 ounces. And if I probably really read the label, I was probably breaking some kind of law somewhere. I was probably over applying. But at the time, you know, I was convinced by the dealer reps and and by my consultants at the time that that stuff was as it was as safe as water. 
there was no excuse for not using it. And then, you know, later on, I was, when I started trying to make a change, I was actually accused of using it as a crutch. That one kind of hit me in the gut at the time. I thought, you know, I was using this like you told me, but I do look back now and say, you know, it was, it was a crutch and it was, it was taking the easy way out. So how much from 1700 gallons, how much are you using now? We're probably going to be less than 250 gallons. I'm probably farming 2,400 acres this year. So I've got that significantly down. There was a lot of stuff that I swore I wasn't going to spray. And then if anybody's convinced me that this is a process, it's been you. As a recovering addict, I can't sometimes quit cold turkey. So it's a process. We didn't degrade these soils overnight. We're not going to rebuild them overnight. And uh, we're not going to control these weed populations and get them. And I tried. I, I had a little bit of a failure this year. I planted a lot of non-GMO cotton thinking that this was the way. Um, I didn't want to use glyphosate anymore. And I was going to rapidly force myself into that scenario. But I realized really quickly that I didn't have my soils in the right place and that there was going to have to be a lot more building done before I completely went cold turkey and stopped all of it. I interrupted you a couple minutes ago when you were talking about an observation, different observations that you had made to ask you about the glyphosate. I don't want to lose sight of that thought. So there was another block that we had followed cotton. So when you take the takeoff ratio of a crop, and I believe John and correct me, I think the general takeoff is 40%. I think cotton is probably lower than that because when you get right down to it the seed and the fibers all you're removing from the field and so you have this huge amount of plant material and the leftover cotton bowls that are back on the ground and so so we were trying to prepare this soil to go into onions and it was kind of a rapid turnover sequence that we were trying to do going from harvesting the cotton crop in late november early december to have an onions planted on it by late january We went in and we shredded the crop and we put out a pretty good cocktail of Tanio products and a pretty good cocktail of AEA products, Sea Shield, Rejuvenate, Humicarb, a lot of different products from Tanio, the OPA, the Biodigester. And then we used a lot of Spectrum DS here trying to to remediate everything that was going on in the soil. And that huge shot of OPA trying to get rid of the hydrocarbon carryover that I've had from years And anybody that's applied a lot of herbicide, especially in their crops, especially something like a burn down gramoxin or glyphosate type product, if the boom isn't isn't purged well on the sprayer, you end up with this funky V shape in the field where, you know, you haven't terminated anything and it starts, you see where the boom starts fully charging with the product and it goes out to the end of the boom. So you have this V shape starting at the back of the sprayer. And I've seen it several years with different products where we have that shape, you know, somebody missed it with glyphosate and you have to go in and, and either respray it out or something like that. Well, we saw the same thing this year with the weed population and the onions. And it was only in one field, and it was only where we started with that application. So we we went out, we put that soil primer, I'll call it, out, and we we lightly incorporated it into about an inch to an inch and a half of depth, and then we irrigated it in pretty rapidly or pretty quickly behind that. But about four weeks after onion planting, when we were probably at the one true leaf emergence stage on the onions, we realized that there was this difference in weed population also behind the sprayer and where we had applied the higher rates and probably did a better job of incorporating and getting the the biology and that soil primer out, we had that same V shape. And so that was kind of an aha moment that, wait a minute, I can't just say that the expense of this soil primer helps with one thing i have to look at it in the grand scheme of things and a lot of that was in in that weed pressure also so it was really interesting are you saying that where you applied the primer you had more weed seeds germinating or you had a smaller weed population it was night and day black and white no gray area 
there was probably 90% less weeds germinated in the applied portion than there was in the misapplied or missed portion of that and that V behind the sprayer. Wow. So, you know, it doesn't go very far out into the field. It only goes out 50 or 60 feet. It's really dependent on how fast you're running and how well the operator had the boom charged before he pulled into the field. But that was a big, big thing. So, so we started looking at that and said, you know, now we see that this is incredibly important. And so we went back and we looked. We have two seasons onions here. So we have we have a, a short day variety that we seed in late September, early October. And then we have a intermediate variety that we seed in January and February. We were fighting weed at that same point. We were starting to really fight the weed populations in the short day or fall seeded onion. And we realized really quickly that our weed populations were higher anywhere that we had mismanaged through the winter the irrigations and especially where we had overwatered or over applied or we had some spots that don't drain well and they tended to get too wet so there's been a there's been a thought in our area that we have to protect with water these onion seedlings throughout the winter they do go dormant but if they get too dry you'll have a lot of death loss in the winter time so there was this thought process that we had to keep them insulated with water but i realized really quickly by the third or fourth week of march that probably a lot of my weed issues that i was seeing in my fall seeded or short day onions were because of poor water management during december and january on those those onions and I believe that what I probably did was I drowned out my applied biology. So I don't know that we have a whole lot of natural biology in our soils just because of multiple years of poor um, recommendations or poor applications. And I, I say that because the first farm that I put into drip irrigation has always been my favorite farm. So everybody said, you know, there's two ways whenever you institute new new technology, you can either take it onto your worst performing or you can take it onto your best performing. And you're probably not going to see as much of a bump on your best as you would on your worst. But we decided that we had enough water and that it, everything just fit. So we took our best farm and we put that subsurface drip irrigation out and we started in 1999 and for the next five to six years it was my absolute favorite farm to be on it's all i wanted to be i took pictures of it every day and then probably by 2006 2007 it started being my least performing i wasn't ready to see or ready to to admit that i was probably doing this to myself my own demise. What do you attribute that to? We started this conversation by talking about the biology. Are you suggesting that you lost much of your soil biology because of fertilizer and pesticide applications? Well, whenever we did, you know, we put the subsurface drip in because water is probably, well, not probably, it is our most precious resource and it's our highest input cost. So we were doing anything that we could to try and save as much water input for the money as well as it's just a depleting resource and we had to do everything that we could to try and save that. So we put that out with the absolute best of intentions. But when we did that, we also made ourselves or applied the absolute best way to apply nutrients and chemistry directly to the root system, which is what at the time we thought that we needed to do. This strip irrigation allowed us to, you know, set 6,000 gallon poly tanks up at every filter station. Back then, we were using sulfuric acid to control the pH of our water. We were using uh, UN32 as our nitrogen source. We were putting out 1152 for our phosphate source. And then we were backing that up with phosphoric acid through the drip throughout the season. And then there were a few things that we were able to apply, you know, soil apply, anything that had a soil applied or a drip applied on the label. We thought that we had this great way to apply this, this product that put it directly where we needed it. And so we started just hammering it. The very first, and I could, if I could go back, 
if somebody would build me a time machine, I would go back 22 years ago when I first put that system in. The very first thing that I did was I put out a product called KPAM, which is uh, metam potassium. So I didn't even give this thing a chance. The very minute that I had a good way to apply this fumigant, it's a fumigant. Oh yeah, no, I mean it just smoked everything, and we went out at the very first year, and we, you know, I think on ninety percent of the farm, I applied the soil fumigant, and I fumigated everything. It was a cost that, you know, it was a couple hundred dollars an acre, but. I was convinced by the manufacturer and the dealer rep that, you know, I wasn't going to have a weed problem, that I was going to fumigate this stuff and it was going to take care of all of my weeds and it was going to take care of all of my fungal pathogens in the soil and that everything was going to be rosy after that. And so we did that for, you know, several years. Every time we grew onions, some of the time we, we did it before the chili peppers. And I know that I took my favorite farm, made it my worst performing farm, and it only took me six or seven years to do it. And it was just because I had given myself that application method that expedited that process. So you had started this conversation by talking about the primer applications and the water applications. And you had mentioned how you have been costing uh, or perhaps damaging some of that microbial population with water applications during the winter. Can you just clarify that a little bit? What are you seeing happening with water applications that is limiting biology? Well, we don't get a whole lot of rain. I mean, so most of our rainfall falls here during the monsoon season, which starts technically the 15th of June and goes to about the 20th, somewhere in the, around the 20th of September. That's our normal rainfall calendar. Um, we get very little uh, moisture in the winter time. If you tend to leave things fallow or you plant a cover crop, you tend to dry that soil out if you're not irrigating it quite a bit. One of my other aha moments was I had done a pretty good job. There's some pictures of you and I standing in a really good cotton field last year, right around harvest time. I felt like I had that soil dialing close to 3% organic matter. We went to the end of the, the season. We termed, you know, got the cotton crop off, uh, started working that soil down. And I decided that I needed to, to fill my soil profile with a pre-irrigation before I, I went in and I uh, put a crop on it. So I fired up that drip irrigation system and I set it to apply four acre inches which is roughly a 48 hour application of water here. I didn't think that it was gonna be a big problem, but I, I actually brought water to the top of the ground, which is not a bad thing here. A lot of times when we're trying to germinate wheat crops or things like that, we have to do it anyway. But a couple of weeks later I went out and I'm a, I'm a soil smeller, I'm a sniffer, and people make fun of me because it doesn't really matter where I'm at, whose farm I'm at. It really makes me happy to smell very healthy soil. I'm always walking through the field and I'll grab a handful of soil and I'll hold it up to my nose. And I realized that I had took a very fungally dominant soil and with a four inch application of water that took 48 hours, I had soured that and realized really quickly that I had probably some dead fungus and a lot of bacteria on my hands again, all because I saturated that soil in a 48 hour time. You know, there's actually a lot of interesting science that supports that smelling healthy soil makes you feel good. Uh, it literally makes you feel good because it has a, a number of neurotransmitter compounds that imitate serotonin and other compounds, and they, they literally make you feel good. So healthy soil is uh, an antidepressant as well. So as a recovering glyphaholic, perhaps you need to smell more soil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> But it, it was it was a concern to me, and I realized that, you know, there's these little things that I guess being a part of the AEA program has kind of opened my eyes and made me look at things a little bit differently and realizing that things matter, you know, that application size matters, that frequency matters on this water, you know, and I would have probably been better off applying that. I had no idea that I was going to be, that I was going to do damage to this biology, but I would have been better off applying multiple short little interval shots a half inch a day for the next eight days or something like that to get that soil profile full so that i wasn't just completely going out and saturating it all in one whack i i've realized that 99 percent of my own problems here have been self-inflicted i've 
you know, all of these things. There's all of this stuff that we go back and we look at and we say, well, now we start to see these linear problems across fields. We even saw some of them when we were running a uh, soil fertility mapping service. Uh, these guys came out and ran a Varus rig across our fields, and we started seeing some things that had probably happened that were applied years before the, the field was put into drip irrigation, some sodium differences and things like that. That was an aha moment that didn't, I knew I had done something, but I didn't know what I had done. But I'm starting to see that those those applications need to come with a deeper thought than reading the label, finding something that's wrong, le- reading the label and, and using the label great. There has to be a cause and effect thought process done with every single application, including water on our farm. Yeah, so there, there's a number of dots that I just want to bring together if I can, or to make sure that we don't lose sight of to your story about water application and the story that you shared previous to that. If I'm understanding it correctly, you're saying that your winter applications of water on the onions was impacting your biological activity the following spring, and that then was impacting your crop. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So, you know, I, f- I find it really interesting. You you describe how a lot of the challenges that you've experienced, you're coming to realize are, are self-inflicted. But, you know, I actually, I think you've made a tremendous amount of progress on, on the journey already and, and the changes that you're seeing in your operation because you're at the point where you see that. And many growers don't yet see that. And yet we see that at AEA so clearly. Uh, and we see it really clearly with SAP analysis. You start looking at SAP analysis data and you realize that all of the nutrient imbalances that are there that are leading to disease and insect pressure are a direct result of the over-application of fertilizers that the farmer is applying. It's like there is this direct, yeah, it's self-inflicted damage, self-inflicted harm, and many people don't realize it. So the fact that you do realize it and are thinking about it puts you at a significant advantage to many growers, I would say, from my perspective. To go along with that, so you said that we had known each other for three or four years. I've actually only been on the AEA program a couple of years now. But to reference the SAP analysis, last year I started off, I was going to enroll 150 acres of onions in the AEA program. And we did everything with that 150 acres that David Miller and the rest of the AEA team recommended that I use. Come about March, I realized that I preferred what I was seeing on the AEA fields. And so I tried to switch everything way after the fact. So we didn't have the soil primers out. We didn't have the early applications. We didn't have everything exactly right, but it gave us a little bit of a platform to start testing on. And so we started pulling saps on the entire 450 or 500 acre crop of onions and we started realizing really quickly that an onion is not an onion is not an onion because (laughs) uh, yellow onions like more nitrogen than white onions white onions don't need a whole lot of nitrogen red onions want more nitrogen than everything does it's it's kind of been interesting because for the last 40 years of growing onions um, one of our highest applied products here was zinc And it's kind of interesting because when we started using sap analysis, the one thing that the onions in two years have not asked for is very much zinc, if any at all. And I mean, we were putting out zinc sulfate a pound per acre every week. So I look back now and what was I doing to my crop while I was applying this product that clearly it didn't want? So, so we spend a lot of money on saps because I test very intensely. We're testing pretty well every two weeks on the onion crop. And I test every variety and every field individually. So my block sizes are between 17 and 25 acre blocks. So we pull a lot of saps and now we've started to build our own, our own set of information. And so now in year two of sap sampling, there was a lot of things that we were able to do that weren't reactionary. We were able to do things ahead of time, kind of anticipating was interesting to me that you know our onion crop really wanted more calcium iron copper we were terribly short on molybdenum i can remember 15 years ago having the the first uh, fertilizer salesman come bring molybdenum and it was one of those things that we tried a couple of times and discounted because we didn't see much of a difference but but now that we're pretty intensely applying 
we have extremely low levels of molybdenum, extremely low levels of cobalt. You know, we're applying quite a bit of cobalt on this stuff. It's incredible to see what we've been able to do in such a short period of time on a crop that not a lot of people really understand how to grow. And I say that because the physiology of an onion is so different than a tree or a chili pepper or a cotton plant or anything else because we don't have a stem. We're still trying to understand if there's a true correlation between old leaf and new leaf because if you're not going through a stem, do you really have the translocation from leaf to leaf like you would? You really only have the only connective tissue from old leaf to new leaf is a root plate. And so we're really trying to understand if the historic ways of testing through sap are correct. We know that the bulb of an onion is a swollen leaf base. You know, we've actually hypothesized that maybe there should be a test where we're testing leaf tip versus bulb if the nutrient is is flowing one way or the other between those. But I will say that by year two on our onion crop, and we've gone through, you know, rotation crops, and I know it's going to get better as we go. We're using currently about 40 to 50% of our nitrogen requirement. Prior, we were using 32% on everything the last two years we've been using dissolved urea and with your mix applying the humicarb the rejuvenate i use quite a bit of sea shield with my mixes just to feed the biology david and i talked earlier david miller with aea and i had talked about part of the thing that we're doing with the the application of nitrogen the way we're doing it now is we're actually Uh, feeding a constant source of carbon back because I remember an early conversation with with the team that said, you know, our defining problem here in New Mexico where our organic matters are super low because of our heat and salts and everything else, our defining to yield potential was probably going to be a lack of carbon or lack of CO2 at the right time. And so starting that carbon cycle And having that constant flow as we apply nitrogen is important. So we've spoken a bit about your history of different pesticide applications and how that has impacted your biological populations. We haven't really talked about any changes in the crop that you've really observed. How have crop quality and yields and so forth been developing over the last couple of years? It was a little bit of a disappointment in the 2020 onion crop, but I think it was a huge step forward. We had to learn a lot, and we did in a short period of time. On the cotton crop, it was exactly the opposite of that. You guys had a pretty good amount of experience in cotton. We came in, that we hit the first pitch, and we probably got a a double out of that. We went, went a long way. I think this year we've got an even better start on that. Understanding our soils, because every place and every every farm is kind of going to be different. So you're going to deal with a different set of problems based on the, the history of the last 15 or 20 years and the applications. I was probably a little bit more dramatic just because of my intense chemical use. And when I say intense chemical use, you know, I, with one of the big three chemical companies, I had a deferred payment plan with them and it was pretty much an open checkbook and i i used it and used it often i applied a lot the soil the fumigants the soil applied you know if there was anything that was systemic that was able to be applied we did we put it out you know so it's kind of disheartening to see where we were but it's also it's very heartwarming to see where where i'm at today and really i sat down a couple of days ago And I realized that my last insecticide purchase was probably June of 2020. So I've gone almost 12 months without a single insecticide application on my farm. Wow. And that compared, we haven't talked about insecticides really, but what was the use historically? Um, So on our onion crop, we were probably on, I've I've gone to as many as, um, well, as often as four days returns on insecticide applications and mainly lanate until things got really hot and then we would switch to something like warrior or something a little bit uh, different tech but we were trying to fight onion thrip and western flower thrip like crazy in our onion crop 
It's kind of interesting because the the first story that I that my new consultants and I had was we had a ligus problem in our cotton crop, and he came in and he gives me his recommendations on Friday afternoon, and he wanted me to spray, and it was it was a fairly light application of insecticide. He wanted me to spray about a thousand acres of cotton, which is quite a bit to get across in a week, but because the ligus were starting to really show up. He, you know, he was pretty adamant about we had to get this under control quickly or we would start affecting yield. I took that recommendation to my rep, David Miller, with AEA and said, you know, I've got a ligus issue. He wants me to spray X. And David said, please don't spray this. Let me put you together a foliar application. So he he put together a recommendation. And by Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, we started spraying the foliar app. So it took us four or five days to get across, you know, with water irrigation scheduling and things to get across that thousand acres. And and the next Friday, actually, I guess it was on Thursday, the consultant called and asked if I had gotten everything sprayed. And because he was checking another farm, a friend of mine that had the same problem and had applied to chemistry. And I assured him that I had everything sprayed. And so he met me here at my office and we had our quick little conference call with David Miller and and we went over everything. And I had already keyed David into the fact that I had applied the uh, foliar application that he had recommended, but that I didn't want him to say anything to my consultant that I had done it. And so we parted ways and the consultant left. And about two hours later, he came driving back up and he he says, I thought you said you sprayed everything. And I said, I did spray everything. And he said, did you use the chemical that I told you to? And I said, no, but do we have ligus? And he said, I knew you didn't use it because you still had all the beneficials alive. What happened with the ligus? Well, the ligus left. Either the beneficials got strong enough to eat the ligus or the ligus decided that they didn't want the cotton. They didn't like it anymore because they were no longer an issue. And so it was kind of interesting to see. So a little history on my current crop consultant. He used to be a dealer rep. He used to work for one of the big chemical companies that sold everything. So he's very chemistry minded. He's very he's very good at what he does. But he was very much go to the green book and figure out what would kill this thing and apply that. And it was kind of interesting because by the end of that afternoon, he says, maybe we need to apply something like that in the onion crop. Maybe we can apply that to control the thrip. And so we took that idea back to David and said, you know, do you think this is something that we can do? That's why I say that all occurred back in June. And by July, we were no longer applying any insecticides. Wow. So I'm actually harvesting. I'm harvesting my 2021 short day onion crop right now. And it's had no fungicide no insecticide, and I'm harvesting on a 75-acre block right now that for the first time in my life also had no herbicide applications. So these things have given me the confidence to switch over and to actually start looking at and have organic certified crops in the near future. So last year, 2020 growing season, if I'm understanding correctly, was your first year of experience working with AEA. And this is your second one. You mentioned that you had very different experiences on the onion and on the cotton. Can you tell us a bit more about that? What happened with the onions? What did not go well? What did we learn from that? I'd also love to get your perspective on the cotton a little bit as well. Well, I think part of what we did wrong on the onions was we didn't start. I think it's imperative that really shined a flashlight straight in my eyes that it's imperative to have the biology in the right place at the right time. So when we tried to throw this thing out, Like I said, we were only going to do 150 acres of a 450-acre onion crop with the AEA program. So applying this stuff, it's imperative to have it in the right place at the right time. And we realized that then, and we continue to learn, and we continue to see that it's very important to have this stuff applied at the right time. You can't go back and rescue. You can, but it wasn't as good as it has been this year. So... I guess anything is better than nothing, but but we've seen a huge leap forward this year over what we had last year. And I think a lot of that was just having everything in its place in the right time. I remember a conversation one day, David Miller calling me up on the phone and saying, did you know that oxyfluorophen inhibits cell division in root systems? And that came about, I think that was the right compound, came about as a result of an experienced observation that he had had with you on on your onion crop. 
What was the story? Actually, it wasn't oxyfluorophen. It was chlorpyrifos. And so... Oh, there you go. Thank you. We have been putting down... Prior to that, we were using inferofuridan, and then we had switched everything over to inferodiazinon, chlorpyrifos. And for the last several years, the EPA has had chlorpyrifos on the chopping block. We've got customers that requested that we not use it. There was a big fight between us and customers that were saying, you know, we would prefer you not to use chlorpyrifos or we won't buy product from you. But we thought that we had to have chlorpyrifos. And the reason that we used it was onion maggot. So a couple of years ago, I'm the first to admit that I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. One of them was I tried a cover crop right before the onion crop, and it was a brown mustard and arugula cover crop. The thought process on that was that we were going to incorporate that into the soil and we were going to get a gassing off effect that was going to be very similar to a soil fumigant. But what we actually ended up doing was we left a very good refuge for onion maggots to breed and to grow. So I guess it was 2019, we had a huge amount of onion maggot problem and we had we had put the chlorpyrifos down with the seed and we got, we felt like very little control out of that. So in 2020, I still wasn't convinced. It was, it was my first season with AEA. I was dipping a toe in it. AEA didn't know everything about what we did and I didn't know everything about what AEA did. So when we put the we put the soil primer out and we went out with the seed and we put down chlorpyrifos. And lo and behold, we still had some problems with onion maggot. It just ended up being one of those years where onion maggot was a problem. A lot of people start injecting diazinon into the drip tape, trying to get it into the soil because these onion maggots stay underneath the soil and they're quite hard to kill with an application from above. So 2020, we had that onion maggot outbreak my brother, a couple of other farms that grow onions for me, started putting out the diazinon, the recommended and the, the typical application. And David said, let's let's try something different. And we applied, I believe it was a molybdenum boron mag sulfate foliar. And we had better control of the onion maggot. And I mean, it was immediate than anybody that was actually putting out the chemistry through their drip systems did. We, at that point, realized really quickly that, you know, we didn't kill any biology. We didn't kill any of our earthworms or anything else with this. And we, for probably maybe 10% more expense than that cheap chemistry that we were going to apply, we foliar fed. And how much more benefit did we get out of doing that? Because we had completely just annihilated. I mean, it. so we didn't kill anything. We just made it where it didn't want to be there anymore. That was the first one. And then the Liga situation was the second one. You know, those were the two moments that were like, my God, this is actually something that we can do. Was there then an experiment or a treatment where there was chlorpyrifos treated and untreated where there were significant differences in root size? Am I recalling that correctly? No. So we, we pretty much, when we realized after the 2020 season that we were putting down chlorpyrifos, our customers didn't want it, the EPA didn't want it, and we weren't getting any, any good treatment. It, it just wasn't worth it. Now, observationally, again, I feel like we had better stand establishment and we had better. Now, there's a lot of things that I can attribute that to. It was having the biology in the right place at the right time and not using the chlorpyrifos. But we felt like we had a better stand faster because we didn't have that chlorpyrifos out in that seed box, you know, dribbling behind the seed. So... When I hear you talk about diazinon applications, it just uh, it makes me cringe internally because uh, we actually have sweet onion growers that we've worked with in the past in uh, in the eastern United States where they're planting sweet onion seedlings or bare root seedlings, and particularly some of these farms with more fertile soils, they have a significant problem where the earthworms, particularly the night crawlers, will come out and they'll pull the entire seedling into the ground and uh, they'll eat it uh, to the point where they can easily lose 30% of their plant population in a matter of a couple of days if they're not careful. One grower came up with the idea of putting on a diazinon application to kill all the earthworms and we discovered, lo and behold, it was very effective at that. There were, there were dead earthworms 
all through the soil profile. With your historical diazinon applications and the different things that you've been doing, what have you observed with your earthworm populations over the years? Well, it's kind of interesting because I, I farm in a valley and I've got, there's probably 60 foot of elevation difference whenever you go either direction out of the valley. The bottom is, is kind of a, a really um, silty loam. And then as we go up and out, we get into all the way up to what I would call rocky soil. So it's a, a sandy loam type texture. But I've always had a little bit of an earthworm population down in the silty loam type stuff. And I was told by people that I put a lot of faith in at the time that, well, you know, that's the only type of soil that those worms really want to be in here in the desert. And I actually had somebody tell me one time that the black ants here were the worms of the desert. And just to let the ants do their job, they would tend to fix the soils like the earthworms do. And it's kind of interesting because towards the end of last season, I started seeing an earthworm population up into that sandy loam, rocky type soils where I had been told for years that there was no way that worms would actually be able to to live there. You know, we keep things pretty well covered now. We have for probably the last 10 years with cover crops, but I have to manage my moisture to keep my worm population in good shape also i can't let this stuff dry out and crack because there's a lot that i've got going in there now in the last two years that i real i've realized that i say the farm you know saved the ranch but i feel like now i'm a i'm a livestock producer but i'm just producing livestock underground and i've got to take care of them too yeah i think it's it's an interesting perspective with the background that you have in higher value crop production if we apply that same level of management intensity to our soil biology as we do to our crop, we can be in a very different place very quickly as you're observing within just a couple of years. With the experiences that you've had so far and and the crop changes and the soil changes that you've observed so far, what do you think the opportunity is? How will your crops and soils look different in the future? What is the upper yield potential that your system is really capable of? What are you aspiring to? Go back to that conversation that we had back in Lubbock. You know, there were 40 or 50 of us farmers sitting in that room at the time. And I think you asked what the potential was, the genetic potential was for cotton production. At the time, I think the highest yield anybody had ever heard of was like 8.2, 500 pound bales per acre of lint. That was kind of a considered to be a an offshoot. It hasn't really been hit. There's not a lot of people that have gotten that high of yields in cotton typically with upland cotton varieties there's a lot of the seed companies that have what they call their one ton club so a four bale crop would be a good thing pima cotton which is the variety that i grow a lot of or extra long staple it's a higher quality cotton than egyptian cotton or giza cotton it's exclusively grown in the desert southwest of the U.S., or not exclusively. There's other areas that can grow similar cottons. It generally yields in the 1,000 pound to maybe 1,200 pound. I think our, our county average here was 888 pounds per acre. So in our first year with AEA, our best fields did right around 2,100 pounds per acre. And I say our best fields, it wasn't like that was a 20 acre block. That was actually a hundred acres that set in five blocks together. There was a little bit of management differences in that. And there was some other, some other things that we realized really quickly. We had enrolled that hundred acres. Well, a little bit more than that with a company out of the Netherlands called Erawatch, which has a kind of a neat satellite based or satellite platform of being able to monitor evapotranspiration. I get a satellite image a day late, but it actually gives evapotranspiration across different portions of the field based on that satellite imagery. And we had that part of the farm enrolled last year with a trial with Erawatch, and it was interesting to see, and I changed my irrigation on that and i think that probably had a lot to do with the increase also but now that i know how important water management is to the biology i think it's kind of hand in hand all the way across one of the biggest things that we realized we were irrigating 
like on a four day, we would go out and put 12 hours of water, which is kind of the equivalent to an, an inch of water every third day. And with the EraWatch, it gave us a little bit of confidence to back that up where we were actually irrigating every day or every other day. So really short intervals and coming back on that really quickly. You know, we had no saturation and we had no drying out. We just had to keep the wick constantly wet. And so we've seen that. We enrolled several acres of our onions this season in that same scenario. We have to learn how to manage that data and use that data. I don't think for our individual, I don't like to keep it as dry as the EraWatch program recommends it, but I've, I've learned how to use the information that that system gives me and apply it on my farm to manage that that much better. Our cost of water here is about depending on what time of year it is and our our electricity rate because we buy electricity at a couple of different rates our inch of water can cost between eight and ten dollars so this system there was a little bit of an argument amongst you know i farm with my dad and my brother and there was a little bit of you know is that eight dollars worth it they don't charge eight dollars it's less than that i think it's like six dollars and fifty cents a an acre And I said, you know, if we can just save ourselves an inch of water, it pays for itself. But think of what we can do with improved production from having better water management also. And it's kind of interesting because Wim Bastiansen, the the founder of EraWatch, and I have had several different conversations about what he's doing and how he's trying to put this thing together. And he thinks that he's actually got a way that he can start carbon modeling and so it'll actually show based on that satellite imagery it's not about the sequestration of carbon it's more about the carbon cycle and how how well the the system is functioning and to have the ability to sit and look at 23 or 2400 acres on the screen of my computer and to understand that i have some parts of the field or some parts of the farm that have a better you know, that engine is running better and smoother than others, I think that'll really help us dial in what we're doing differently in some areas than others, you know, from that that high of a level. I, I'm excited with what that might potentially do. I really appreciate the perspective that you're bringing forward on water because it's something that I agree is so important and it is often, it's not given enough credit. Uh, I'm reminded of an experience that I had probably 12 years ago at this point with a tomato greenhouse that we were working with in Pennsylvania. The first year that we were working with them, they were just starting out. They were just learning how to manage a greenhouse as well. Their standard irrigation protocol was to irrigate once a week. And they harvested a fairly dismal, if I recall correctly, it was 12 pounds of tomatoes per plant in that greenhouse environment. These were a determinate variety. So only harvesting for about 60 days or so. And then they were going out into the field. We made some changes to the nutrition management and I pushed them very strongly to irrigate more frequently. So they moved from once a week to three times per week and that moved the yield to 15 pounds per plant. Then they were happy with the increase. They put in a new system to be able to automate everything and they went from three times per week to five times per week. They were irrigating five days a week. They were only putting on nutrients twice per week at this point. That moved their yields to 18 pounds per plant. Increasing these tomato yields with the exact same variety, the same management, the same irrigation water, the same nutritional protocols, but just increasing the irrigation frequency and the consistency of water supply and the consistency of nutrient supply. That is, I think, an interesting corollary to what you're experiencing of shifting cotton yields from 880 pounds an acre to 2,100 pounds an acre. That's a 250% yield increase just by improved nutrition and water consistency. Yeah, I'm kind of excited about what the potential is this year on a grander scale, you know, rather than trying this portion of it on 100 acres or 200 acres, trying it on, you know, 1,000 acres and seeing if I can see that, you know, make that same huge step just in the water management thing. There was a thought process here, and I don't know who came up with this, but that we had to go with long duration and long times in between irrigations because we needed to shift that and push that sodium level away. If you actually had a soil moisture sensor, the swings between, and we would have gone from saturated to completely dry. So, 
you know, we would have gone from way over field capacity or, or at field capacity down to 40% before we irrigated again. And so now that I understand the behavior of the biology in the soil, the more level that I can keep that, I think the better off I'm going to be and the better crop that I'm going to have and the less weeds I'm going to have and so on and so forth. It's kind of interesting because you look at these platforms like EraWatch, there's a lot of new things that are coming out. And it kind of takes me back because I grew up, uh, like I said, I'm a fourth generation. I never knew my great grandfather, but I knew my grandfather really well. He always pretty well lived by a quote. I had to look it up this morning. It was by Alexander Pope. And it, it words, be not the first by whom the new are tried, nor yet the last to lay the old aside. He always, that was just his thing is, you know, we don't need to be the first ones to try this. And we sure don't need to be the last ones to lay the, if it's proven that it's wrong. I guess just me being kind of the rebel and he and I used to butt heads a lot. I've kind of been the guy that has always looked for technology. I've always looked, there's got to be a better way. You know, I talked about 20 years ago, we were mostly siphon tube irrigated And we used black poly siphon tubes. And so, you know, supposed to be 105 degrees today. So you went and picked up a pile of tubes. You know, you were going to burn your arms. You were going to burn your hands. When it had water running through it, it was okay. But if you just picked up dry tubes, it was hot. It was dusty. We had to, you know, we had to shovel up ends. There was a lot of physical work. And and I was always the guy that stood at the end of of the row and and started siphon tubes and thought, God, there's got to be a better way to do this. And then when drip irrigation came along, I told some people a long time ago that I I hoped that my children would have to go to a museum to see a siphon tube. So I was, I wanted to get rid of that as quickly as possible. I've always been an early adapter. I've, you know, the AeroWatch program, it was great to be part of that and to see some of that stuff. And you saw it whenever you visited, but you didn't get to see it running. We got to beta test a, a new autonomous robot that's actually going to be able to shoot weeds or is shooting weeds right now with the lasers. The cool thing about it is the technology and something like that, it's not linear in its improvement, it's exponential. So as it gets better, it gets better. As it gets better, it gets better. So really fast the computers get better the lasers get better the the deep learning of the ai gets that much better the weed model gets that much better and it's kind of interesting because when they arrived here on my farm in october it was kind of sluggish and it was a little bit slow and they had to pull the machine forward and then evaluate everything and shoot now they have that thing going i think they're shooting like a hundred thousand plus weeds per hour they're able to run this thing. They're they're out demoing it now in onion fields, carrot fields, spinach, lettuce. They've got it all over. I took a lot of heat amongst the family because when these guys, with what we saw in the first six weeks of them being here, when they offered me a contract, I signed it. Absolutely no. There was no questions asked. I, I couldn't wait to get this technology on my farm as quickly as possible. And I think that might be one of the things that will get me into the organics that much faster on a grand scale. I want to go back to the water conversation for just a moment. You're talking about managing water in the soil profile to benefit biology and to benefit plant health and to keep water consistency. And I think it's important to point out that for your soils, you have soils and an environment which is conducive to drying out very quickly. What happens over time as you continue to develop this soil profile, there's a good probability that you will develop soils that are much better aggregated to a much deeper depth where you have a larger cushion and you won't have the very rapid water variability that right now requires you to maintain that constantly with irrigation. Well, and we've seen that somewhat with increasing the covers and getting our organic matter coming up. But as I said before, you know, we were convinced that that we had to run that long duration to push that sodium away. But now that we've got a little bit better understanding of how the soil wicks, you know, you don't have to purge that stuff out every five days and get it two foot past the root zone. All you have to do is keep that and that wetting front will continue to move those sodiums out. And it's interesting because that's another thing that we've seen through the SAP analysis is, you know, from last year to this year and the application of the soil primers, 
and probably in, in some aspects to uh, managing our moisture a little bit better. But our sodium levels and our saps have, have decreased already just in one year. So it'd be really neat whenever we bounce back onto this stuff, some of this stuff that's been on the program for two, three, four years, and we start seeing that. And that was one of the things that we saw when the Kinsey fertility guy, he came and he pulled some of this, he pulled several soil samples and he called me back from Missouri a couple of weeks later when we got results. There was one field that old timer organic consultant had sold me on some Tanio products and this is, you know, several years prior, but he called me and he says, hey, I have this one farm that I call the West Farm. He says, West 2 Block has really significant, significantly less sodium. What did you do differently there? And so I went back through my notes and it was interesting. It was the first place that I had applied a, a Spectrum product, which is, you know, it's kind of the base of your of your soil primer program. So it didn't have all the other goodies in it that we put in with it now, but it was kind of one of those slaps in the faces that we didn't see immediate results from the spectrum application, or we didn't think we saw immediate results. But 10 years, eight years, nine years down the road, we saw the results in the soil sample that the the sodium was significantly less. And, and that probably could be attributed back to that increased biology. Wow. It's interesting to see those effects happening a decade later. That's a really fascinating story. So James, with, with the shift in approach that you have taken on your farming operation over the course of the last several years in particular, it's been happening for a while. As you said, you're an innovator and an early adopter. What is it that really motivated you to go down this pathway that is a very different pathway and is uh, considered to be rather radical by some people perhaps? I mean, we were headed to the poorhouse. In the early 2000s, I felt like everything that I touched turned to gold. And it was not hard for us to be profitable. I looked at my father. I looked at my grandfather and my father, and they were two of the best farmers, two of the best producers and best businessmen that I ever knew. Come about 2006 or 2007, things started rolling over on me, and I found profitability hard. And my dad, bless his heart, because when my dad turned it over to me. He guided me, but he hasn't, you know, ruled with an iron fist. And so he's let me make mistakes and he's let me make decisions on my own. And so there's a lot of things that he'll tell me, you know, son, that won't work. We've tried that before. Uh, there's some of that that we really butt heads on, but he tends to allow that. But I looked at this, here was a man that was in his seventies that was worse off than he was when he was in his forties. That burden fell upon me that took me to some of my lowest points as far as my ambition it took me to some of my lowest points emotionally spiritually i felt like everything that i was doing was wrong it didn't matter what decision it was i should have done the opposite because if i decided i should have i should have done one thing i should have you know everything was just wrong and it was kind of interesting because the slap in the face to go back to earlier in our conversation, when I sat and listened to your story, it resonated so, I mean, it just like ripped my heart out right in the middle of that room because my God, here's this man that I've never met before standing before me in front of this room that had the exact same scenario happen. I'm in the desert Southwest and he's in Northern Ohio and our stories could be told. I could tell his for him and he could tell mine for me. And they were the same, the same problem. They were the same thing. It just took me longer to figure it out. It took me, you know, I had to, I had to have, you know, I think it was uh, Arden Anderson and he might've been quoting somebody else. And, and I've heard you say it too, or quoting Arden on it about when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Everything just had to fall into place, but I think my heart had to be in the right place to accept that also. Yeah, you know, it's um, hearing you express that brings, uh, brings a few tears to my eyes because uh, when I think about uh, the commonalities between our stories, but also about what is it that brought us to this place that other people have not, uh, what is unique about our experience and, and why did we experience this and other growers have not? I think the, the common theme, the common thread 
that is common in both of our experiences is that we were using pesticides and fertilizers and all these different treatments very intensely, even more intensely than other growers in the area or uh, of the time. I don't want to use the word fear. It's not a fear. I actually feel reasonably confident that the proverbial brick wall that we smacked against, that you experienced and that I experienced, is still in the near future for many other farmers if they continue down the pathway that they're on. It's just simply that we arrived earlier because we were more intense. You know, I, I see that exact same scenario playing out on friends of mine that farm. And I've, I've gone to them and said, I see this, this happening in your three to five years behind me, not being able to keep a crop alive. You know, it's, it's frustrating whenever you, when you see a crop emerge beautifully and on second or third irrigation, it starts dying on you because it has rhizoctonia or something similar to that. Those things didn't used to occur. I see that starting on other people's farms and I've tried to explain to them, but I've realized really quickly that not everyone is willing to hear it. And the best thing that I can do is just lead by example. And if they want to ask me a question, be willing to share the story, to share the program, to share anything that they're willing to listen to. My goal is not to push this on everyone. It's to pull this on everyone so that everybody sees that this is a better way, that I'm still fighting the fight. So I can't say that I'm to that point where everybody keeps telling me, well, you know, if you get to 3% organic matter, everything becomes rosy. Well, I'm not, I guess I'm not there yet because it's still not easy. And we're in a challenging environment. In your environment, it's never going to be rosy. Just giving you a heads up. <laughs> I keep, I keep thinking that there's going to be something that makes this easier, but I, I also have to remember that if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah. How has your family embraced the different direction you're going? You know, my dad, I respect him more than I could ever convey in words. And it's kind of interesting because he had a health scare several years before we made this journey. But he had an autoimmune disease and went to a rheumatologist. And the rheumatologist did everything to kill his immune system possible. The disease problem that he had, autoimmune diseases, is just your immune system attacking your body. And so the rheumatologist was trying to kill the immune system. And the treatment was killing him. And so he ended up actually being told that there was nothing more that they could do for him. The insurance company was no longer going to fund the procedures that the rheumatologist was doing and, you know, that he had a limited life expectancy. He came along a, a different doctor that was an MD with a PhD and was doing a lot of research. And when he went to that doctor, the first thing that he did was he made his immune system as robust as he possibly could, as quickly as he possibly could. He got rid of all of the pharmaceuticals, put him on a, on a little bit of a pharmaceutical to just kind of reset his immune system. And he's had seven birthdays that he was never supposed to have. And so he attributes a lot of what we're doing here with the AEA program on the farm to the same way that that doctor saved his life was by, instead of trying to kill everything, it was, let's try to make everything so resilient and so strong that the disease is no longer an issue. And it completely went into remission, which the rheumatologist told him was impossible. So I've had very little fight with him on this. I mean, he's been excited about seeing, seeing the change. And then now that we're harvesting the 21 onion crop and he sees the yields that we're having, and it's kind of neat because it's not only my dad, it's employees that they see the difference too. They see the fact that they're no longer handling chemistry. You know, it's kind of neat to be able to go out and and make an application and nobody worries about pre-harvest intervals or re-entry intervals anymore. There's not the problem because this is all organic products that we're putting out. There's nobody's going to get hurt. And that 
resonates through, and I think that's improved morale everywhere on the farm. Yeah, that is a lot of fun when you experience that emotional shift. With the robotic laser shooting weeds, are you still doing any hand weeding or are those completely eliminating hand weeding? I don't think we're there yet where it's going to eliminate hand weeding because the timing is is of the essence on the laser weeder. It really likes to target those weeds even before maybe the human eye can. Oh, wow. You know, it was it's kind of interesting whenever you see the camera technology that these guys are hanging on these robots. And all of a sudden it goes through and you watch it on the screen because they had a monitoring program where we were actually watching it go through the field and work. And I thought, God, what the heck are they shooting? And we actually went out and dug it up. These weeds were so small that they hadn't even started producing chlorophyll yet. They had just emerged and they were just breaking the soil. And even with mechanical cultivation, that's the best time to terminate the weed is before it ever starts really producing much chlorophyll. And it was incredible to see that this system was able to do that. It really right now is limited by the weed model. These guys, they're out shooting weeds now in multiple fields across California and Washington and here in New Mexico. And so they're they're having to build a weed database. And so basically they take that information every night and then they label what is crop and what is weeds so that it starts understanding. And then hopefully they believe that at some point they'll even be able to tell us what species and how many they shot per acre of each species. So I think it's going to be kind of neat to see in the future what we can do with that data and how we can understand that data and change, maybe even change our cultural practices and our fertility requirements or needs based on on that weed population and that immense amount of data that we're going to get from that. Yeah, I I asked the question about hand weeding because I was um, curious if there had been changes in soil structure that might influence hand weeding efficiency. That was my reason for asking that question. Where we did see that, and that was one of the things that was raised last year, normally whenever we harvest our onion crop, we have to go in and we run a rod weeder below to loosen the soil. And the tilth in some of the blocks last year had changed to the point where we no longer had to to run that machine underneath it to loosen the, the roots out. And so the people were very excited about being able to harvest because it makes it a whole lot easier whenever you're able to hand pull those onions out. We do a lot of mechanical harvesting, which it's important to have, and we can we can talk about that in a second. But when, when we're hand harvesting, the roots come in clean because they have to be cut with a pair of sheep shears. So the people are, were really happy to see these things come out of the ground, but not only come out of the ground easy, but come out of the ground clean. Clean as in there's no soil hanging onto the bulb anymore or no soil on the root? There's soil, but it's not a four pound dirt clod. Back when we used to call this stuff dirt, it really got clotty on me. So when it would dry out, it would tend to clot real bad. And we'd have these massive clods that it made it really very difficult to hand harvest. Got it. So you were commenting also a little bit about uh, mechanical harvesting and the need for mechanical harvesting. Well, so labor's getting short, labor's high. You know, we're having to pay more every year for labor. So a few years ago, we decided that we needed to mechanize our harvest. So so we traveled to Spain and found a wonderful manufacturer that makes a very delicate onion harvester, mostly because with our onions, summer onions have a really high sugar content, a really high water content, and bruising tends to be one of the biggest factors that we deal with in quality. What we found last year and especially this year, is that the integrity of the crop with the nutritional balance seems to make harvesting with a machine so much easier because we don't have the problem with bruising. And I remember in one of our early conversations, it was talked about cell wall integrity and calcium, the need to have good calcium, to have good cell wall integrity, And we're seeing that because some of our varieties that have historically been almost as soft as a sponge now come out of the ground as hard as a rock 
but they didn't lose any of their flavor. They actually are better now than they were before, but the integrity of that crop is so much better that it actually allows us to use the mechanical harvester more. Wow. You've had lots of interesting experiences over the last couple of years, haven't you? It's been a whirlwind, I tell you. <laughs> uh, Sounds like a whirlwind. <laughs> and everything I thought I knew, I had to forget. After we left that cotton school, there was another producer in there that I knew very well from my association with Cotton Incorporated and the board of Cotton Incorporated. And she was there, and it was actually her and her husband, and they brought one of their children with them. And myself and my son were there. And when we left, I actually told my son, I said, you've been given a gift because you haven't been taught all of this. Most of us that were sitting in that room have to forget 20 or 30 years of indoctrination by chemical companies, fertilizer manufacturers, consultants, and everything else that for the last 20 or 30 years, you know, we thought they had our best interest at heart. But now we have to forget everything that they've taught us. You're sitting in a unique position because you're not clouded with all that bad data and bad science like like the older generation is. And it was it was refreshing to see a couple of young people. And I mean, 17, 18, 19 year old kids sitting in that room trying to learn from you. It's very rewarding. But, you know, we're having this conversation earlier about this mantra that is often coming from a political perspective that, oh, you have to believe in the science, you have to believe in the science. But it's very frequently the people who engage in that mantra that want us to ignore certain parts of the science. They don't want to include everything, just certain aspects of it. And so I think really what I'm excited to see happening is more openness and more inclusiveness of different perspectives in the agricultural community. Well, trust me, John, I found a Facebook post of my own that showed up in my Facebook memories from six or seven years ago where I was absolutely discounting everything about organic production. And I thought it was the most ignorant thing that I had ever heard of. I think it probably was something about organic is an Indian word for sprayed at night or something stupid like that. <laughs> but that shows the ignorance of myself. I was convinced that there were no residues. I was convinced that everything had a life and had a half-life and that that was all that was important was the half-life and, you know, this stuff it would go away. And I think one of the aha moments that I had was we ended up in the hemp fiasco of 2019. We grew some hemp. We had about 140 acres of hemp, CBD, extractable hemp. And when we went to harvest this stuff, we grew it all in an organic fashion. We applied nothing to it. But when we harvested it and extracted the oil, so we, we went through, we soil tested, we found no chemical residues in soil. We grew the crop, we harvested it, we found no chemical residues in the crop. When they extracted the oils, we actually found chemical residues. And so we went back and the best that we could figure was that chemical residue originated on a seed treatment that we were using in onions nine years prior. Wow. And so that was another one of my, oh my God, what have we been doing to ourselves? Because if we continue to feed ourselves and spoon feed this stuff, you know, every time we eat a watermelon, we may be down to parts per billion, but if we eat enough watermelons, we're going to ingest this and we're just constantly doing it. That was one of the things that weighed heavily on the gray matter between my ears is what are we doing? Because we've been told that this is safe, but whenever we see this residue nine years later coming out of the soil, that was kind of a scary situation to me. Yeah, I think there is uh, the benefit of open-mindedness gives us very different perspectives. So James, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Are there any additional topics that you would like to speak about that we haven't touched on yet? I, I know your next question, because I've listened to your podcast so much, is what, you know, what is the one thing that, that I believe that is true that other people don't? And I guess it's been kind of an epiphany is the connection. We have that ability to connect. We just have to open our hearts and open our minds to be able to connect to the soil and to be able to connect to the plant. 
And I talk about technology and I talk about being able to see these things remotely and getting it, but there's still no, in my mind, there's still no better reward or better way to, to do it than to get out into the field. And I've progressed past a soil sniffer and I think I've become a soil hugger because I, I find myself even laying down and just asking, asking the crop and asking the soil, what do you want me to do? What is my role and what is, what can I do for you? And what can you do for me? Part of that has become people that were driving by on the road probably thought I was crazy, but I'm guess I'm at a point in my life where I could care less. I, you know, I get my reward from that and I think the crop is rewarding me back with having that positive connection to it and the soil. That's a wonderful note, James, to end on. So I want to say thank you for everything that you've shared, for your wisdom, your experiences, your whirlwind. I look forward to having more conversations with you again. Thanks, John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, Visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.